Okay, welcome to the July 11th Committee on Legislative Matters of the Northampton City Council. Uh, and um, this is a, a historic uh, meeting and that it is our first hybrid meeting uh, and the first time I've been in, in person for a meeting here since uh, March of 2020. Um, so we will have uh, some folks here in person, the committee members and, and staff, and then we will have people joining us remotely uh, as well. <clears throat> um, so Laura, would you call the roll? Sure, Councilor Jarrett. Here. Councilor Elkin, here. Councilor Bolton. Present. And Councilor Nash. Here. Uh, so this meeting is being audio and video recorded. And uh, next we will have public comment for items that are not on the agenda. So if you, th there will be a public hearing and there will also be an opportunity for public comment on the other item that we have. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so during the during that time, uh, so but if you are here to comment on something that is not on the agenda, then if you could raise your Zoom hand, uh, or your if your video is on your um, actual hand, and uh, we will take that comment. Don't see any hands raised at the moment. Okay, um, and you can also, if you're having trouble, you can use the chat feature to contact Laura Krutzler, um, who will be able to see that chat. So we'll move on to the approval of the minutes of previous meetings. We have the May 2nd Joint City Services Committee and Legislative Matters Committee minutes, and we have the May 9th Legislative Matters minutes. Uh, could I have a, a motion to approve one or both of those? Second. For both? Yes. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. And yes. Okay. The minutes of those two meetings pass unanimously. Um, and uh, just a reminder, I'm happy to be referred to by my honorific or my first name. Um, I'm fine with the, no need for me for formality uh, here. So we'll move on to 22.110, an ordinance to rezone 130 Pine Street from urban residential B to office industrial. This was referred to the planning board, community resources, and to us legislative matters. Uh, it received a a uh, positive recommendation from the planning board with a request that Bombix meet with the Butters to discuss operating conditions slash restrictions. That was on June 9th. And then I received a positive recommendation from community resources. Um, and as I recall, there was also a question uh, of that, that since the development agreement is not finalized, that that would be um, assuming that that development agreement work would continue and that the full council or this committee would review the, the development agreement more fully. Uh, so we are now going to have a public hearing uh, on this topic. And um, so just a reminder that this for committee members that this is our opportunity to hear from the public and from city staff and to ask questions. And once we close the hearing, if we decide to do that tonight, that we will then deliberate uh, on the recommendation. Um, so could I have a motion to open the public hearing? Move to open. Second. Any discussion? A roll call, please. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Nash. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the public hearing is open, and I'd like to first hear from uh, Carolyn Mish in the planning department, who's here uh, to to speak and as a proponent or sponsor of the measure um, uh, to speak to the item. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so the zoning amendment in front of you all, as, as um, Councillor Jareth um, described, has, has, um, is partway through its path. Um, the, the amendment is what we refer to as a zoning map amendment. So it would change the boundaries, the proposal is to change the boundaries of 
the office industrial district and um Laura, I don't know if you can share your screen and put that up um, just to show, and, and it doesn't have to be long, but I just want to show the boundary changes is for, or, um, would affect one parcel, which happens to be um, uh, the Florence Congregational Church in Florence on Pine Street. And it it is immediate, it's surrounded on two sides by Office Industrial. So the properties along Nonatech Street, which are the properties that are to the rear and then to the side uh, where the former Florence Grammar School is located are also currently Office Industrial. And this uh, property and the remaining parcels to the east and towards Florence Center are Urban Residential B. And the difference, um, so as, as a residential district, um, the opportunities for um, use in those districts are strictly, uh, are pretty strictly re uh, restricted to residential uses. A couple of years ago, um, the same issue came up with respect to the Florence Grammar School, which is the property just immediately to the west. Um, that was also zoned urban residential B. And in order to help protect the historic character of that building and preserve it, the city council uh, amended, um, made a map change and amended that parcel to be office industrial as well. So this is a similar request and for a similar purpose to allow more flexibility to reuse um, the church building and make it more flexible to help um, create uh, sort of financial stability and viability going forward for the for um, the church and its occupants. There are sort of two paths that. Um, uh, well, let me also state that um, there is a um, new tenant that's using the church that uh, that is. Um, Bombix um, um, has, um, or through, I guess, Laudable Productions, has been using the space to, um, a, as an artist space and an event space, and um, they've hosted uh, various events that are not allowed as a standalone use in the Urban Residential B District. Therefore, um, some kind of modification to the zoning would be necessary to allow that use to be brought into the whole mix that's happening in the church. And frankly, that type of use helps support the other uses that are going on in the church and helps protect um, and allow opportunity for um, maintenance and upkeep of that building. In the urban residential B district now, there is a special provision for the protection of uh, religious and in other um, educational uses that are historic buildings. Um, and that's through site plan review from the planning board. Um, an applicant can come forward and request something that's not typically allowed in the residential district, so long as there is an historic preservation restriction um, um, approved for that property, the planning board can grant a use that wouldn't normally be allowed in the district. Um, entertainment functions are not one of the listed um, uses that are allowed currently in urban residential B. So either a zoning change um, to allow that to happen in urban residential B or a map change to a district in which that would be allowed um, is sort of the path that um, our office has determined would be appropriate to allow um, these functions to occur. The um, Bombix um, and the city sort of suggested that office industrial map change would be appropriate so long as an historic preservation restriction were also simultaneously um, recorded on the property because that mirrors what the current provisions are in the urban residential B district sort of for that same um, purpose. 
And so that's the path that we're on right now. And that's where the side development agreement comes into play because it's not written into zoning that this is a provision um, currently that um, is tied to a use. Um, Bombix has um, offered that they their intention is to preserve the building so that they would be amenable to um, agreeing to a development agreement that would result in the recording of an historic preservation restriction. As you mentioned, this went through the planning board. The planning board discussed issues related, you know, the differences between sort of going through the urban residential B path and modifying the zoning versus this path. The planning board also heard about issues during their public hearing in June related to um, potential ancillary impacts from the functions that um, are directly related to what um, Bombix is doing. So mostly, primarily noise and some traffic issues. Um, Plenty Board also heard, and, we, and it was discussed in that hearing, that those issues can be um, regulated through the licensing process, through either the mayoral license provision for entertainment or um, uh, alcohol and liquor licensing that um, is um, much more stringent in terms of regulating noise and other impacts that um, entertainment venues might um, generate on a site. And so that's why the planning board didn't um, feel that it was necessary to uh, add any more possible um, elements to the development agreement beyond just preserving the building in a historic preservation restriction. Great, thank you, Carolyn. Um, questions from counselors first, and then we'll go to members of the public. Stan. Um, Carolyn, what uh, is your uh, what is your reasoning for taking this route uh, to change uh, the zoning map um, as opposed to adding a, uh, a use to URB, which would cover the, the performances um, that Bombix is holding and, and plans to hold, and that then would go through the, uh, the permitting process through the, through the planning board? I think there's sort of two reasons. One is office industrial does allow a, a broader range of uses. Um, so um, back office uses, research and development. In addition, it's easier to share parking and other sort of resources on the ground if you're in the same zone. And since the Florence Grammar School immediately next door has a parking um, area that is currently um, shared from what I understand the church in terms of offering spillover parking that um, that's more easily accomplished when the zoning districts are the same. Thanks. I think it's I think it's in someone's uh, yeah I don't think it's here. Other questions from counselors? Jim. Um, hello, Carolyn. Um, so what other special uses is the applicant looking to do here? I know there's entertainment. Wasn't there something about an industrial kitchen that would also wouldn't fit under URB? Correct. Yes. So um, a commercial can, um, kitchen so that that could be shared for um, and any sort of that kind of use is definitely allowed in office industrial as well. And the plenty, I mean, that could be written into an urban residential B allowance as well, but it might not fit so well in other locations, um, whereas this is right on the edge of the industrial district. And so when we talk about changing the urban residential B text, that would um, open up those opportunities for 
churches and schools throughout the residential district, um, wherever, you, you know, URB is. So um, there are other churches in Northampton that are in urban residential B. So it might not necessarily be so appropriate in those locations, but this is right next to um, the, you know, the Nonotech Mills and, and that um, area. And, and are there other uses that we're anticipating from the applicant other than entertainment or the industrial kitchen, or is there, a, is there other uses that might be helpful for this particular property and the applicant? Well, actually, for this location. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to be clear that, you know, you're looking at changing the zoning and it can't be tied to a particular user. Yes, that's why I was rephrasing. And, <laughs> um, but we have this agreement too that kind of, all right, go ahead. <laughs> right. So there are a range of um, arts and cultural events that um, Bombix um, is anticipating to sponsor. I don't think um, there's necessarily, there are boundaries around sort of all the types of things that would fit into that category, but it's not just about entertainment. It's also about providing space and um, um, community lectures and, and other functions in that space. Um, but again, you know, this is about sort of thinking about, about the uses allowed in office industrial and not necessarily just um, Bombix, even though their intention is to stay there as long as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And um, and so if, if it were URB, it would be required to have its own parking, correct? For this particular use? <clears throat> I'm guessing. So by having it OI, it actually allows this, this sharing arrangement, which I actually know has been going on for years because the, the preschool there, that's, that's right. their pickup drop-off area. And, um, and I imagine while the, the church was in operation that, that um, people parked there as well. So I think that's, that's a great solution. It certainly makes it from a regulatory perspective, because we don't have this um, parking um, requirements that we do in office industrial that there are in urban residential B, that makes it much more flexible and easier to use. There are a number of non what I shouldn't say that there are some non-conforming aspects of the church on this parcel, one of them being parking. So, um, that could continue to exist even in urban residential B as a pre-existing non-conformity, but then it might trigger a requirement to go to the zoning board, for example, if another use were proposed that um, required additional parking. And certainly that would be one of the um, factors in any review that the planning board might undertake for, for a use. One more question. So in relating to the agreement here, so the agreement seems to be, I, when I'm reading it, it, it seems to be based on council approving the zoning and then the agreement kind of comes after it. Um, maybe I'm, I'm not a contract lawyer, but, um, but I, I know as we're, so where does this agreement stand in terms of uh, how, I mean, basically what I, what I see it saying is that, um, that the, um, I guess this is the applicant here for this particular, <laughs> that they um, are, no, it's for, it's for the property owner, right? Yeah, so. It's the property owner, and the way it's written is that the development agreement would get signed first, right. but um, it's sort of tied to the zoning. So if the zoning doesn't change, then um, you know there's a clause here that if it doesn't change within five minutes, um, then um, or it's determined not to be legal, then you know, they don't necessarily have to record the restriction. Right. So the intention is really the development agreement gets signed before the zoning is changed. Okay. So, 
if council approves the zoning before this is signed, we're doing things a little out of order. But typically we would want to see the development. Yes, typically we'd want to see the agreement signed first and then um, that's sort of on the books, a separate action that's taken and then mm -hmm. a zoning change could be made. But that doesn't, I mean, you could as a committee recommend that council adopt it if the development agreement is signed before that vote. So you, you know, if it's not, you don't necessarily, and you have 90 days from the close of the public hearing to um, act on a, a zoning amendment. So it could go to council and then there's time in that 90 day window to um, have that development agreement finalized and recorded. And is there any timeline in terms of getting the, the... <laughs> um, so, I mean, this could go to council by Thursday and council could consider it. And then, um, I mean, outside of the agreement, and then it would up, be up for second reading at our next August meeting. With but you don't, ha I think the way your council rules changed, you don't, your, this Thursday would be your second reading? Oh, this would be the second reading. Um, yeah. So you could just say, let's put it on the, you could say it goes on a subsequent agenda if it weren't, if there weren't enough time. So is there a chance this could be signed by Thursday? I think that would be pretty quick. Okay. I don't know. I, I mean, I do have a meeting with them tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I don't know where they are in that. I, I will say that um, I think one of the concerns was they weren't really, they hadn't seen the language of an historic preservation restriction. So they were a little um, sort of feeling like they were flying right. blind, I think. I mean, I'm putting words in their mouth, but I'm just assuming, you know, that that was an important piece for them, which is understandable. Right. Um, we've since sent them a draft of what a historic preservation restriction would look like in and it and it's definitely um draft so it can be tweaked mm -hmm. um but i think you know they want to be comfortable with that and so it might take a little bit longer than just a few days mm -hmm. okay. thanks yeah i can add a couple pieces of information about that i know that they're the bomb access board has to review it and approve it uh, so that also takes time. And I know that they, they had an intention to, to not rush the process, uh, to slow, to, and I, um, so that, that there's still ongoing discussions between neighbors and Bombix. Um, and there's also, you know, you know, they want to make sure that they fully understand the impacts of the historic preservation agreement. Um, and also, I would note that the church and the synagogue and the preschool will still be in operation, even as Bombix executes their rent-to-own uh, agreement uh, over the next six and a half years. Um, and then other events, uh, weddings and other private events was another thing I've heard, um, which, and some of those already occur as an accessory use or as part of the church and the synagogue use. Uh, so the, that was another use that I had heard. Uh, other questions from counselors before we open it up to the public? Stan. Uh, well, I just, I just wanna say that I, I would be hesitant to approve the zoning change before I see the uh, completed um, agreement, development agreement. Um, the development agreement, um, as I see it in this draft is a, a imposes a permanent historic preservation restriction. Correct. Correct. Permanent being the maximum of 30 years. Okay. So it imposes a 30 year mm -hmm. agreement restriction. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there elements of that that would that would make it very difficult for other uh, allowed uses in OI to be carried out. For example, manufacturing, uh, wholesale trade and distribution, uh, research and development. Uh, what 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 is in that agreement 
preserve the historic nature of the building that would make it very difficult for other allowed uses uh, in OI to, 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 be, uh, to be executed. The historic preservation restriction is really about protecting the exterior elements that are historically significant. So the windows, the door openings, the you know the roof lines. Um, it can be materials and and um, um, trim and things like that that are visible, um, and. To the extent that those other, it's very hard to repurpose a church building for those types of uses that you're referring to. Um, so, and it's um, typically those types of uses don't want to be on a, a, a street like Pine Street. So I think the, um, the there wouldn't be much incentive or inducement for a user of those kinds that sort now that's different i mean research and development is different because it could just be people in an in a sort of more of a typical office um setting doing um you know analysis or something like that um and that's not doesn't create the same kind of impacts that a warehousing and distribution facility would be. But this is a very small site and is probably not conducive to those kinds of uses. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, I mean, that's important. I think that while the, while the uh, intent of the development agreement is to preserve historic aspects of the building, it will also serve to limit what could be feasible, feasibly used uh, in that, in that space. Right. Thanks. And I would note uh, that one of the concerns I think that Bombix has is that they want to do upgrades to, you know, for um, energy efficiency and soundproofing and such. And would the historic pre preservation restriction uh, make that more difficult? And that's one of the questions I think they want to work out. Um, before signing it. Right. And, and but and the other side of that is that we want, um, I think from the city's perspective, we want people to reinvest in these historic structures in order to preserve them and let them see new or expanded life um, so they can continue to be an important part of our neighborhoods. And so um, the historic preservation restrictions can be flexible enough to allow modifications and those upgrades uh, so that those uses can pay for those important energy efficiency upgrades and soundproofing. But it really is, so the focus would be sort of directing those kinds of changes to the interior or the rear of a structure um, so that they still can be made, but they won't, um, really change the character, the exterior character of that building. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's hear from members of the public that we have here. Um, so if you all would like to raise your hand either on Zoom or in uh, person, if, and Laura, are you able to, it's actually really hard for me that it, the, the print is really small. Can you um, identify who's raising their hand? Carrie Casper has uh, raised their hand. Great. Uh, Carrie? Yeah, hi, actually, I'm, hi everyone. I'm here with my husband, Scott Laidlaw, um, and we wanted to address you all and we're thrilled that we are here and have the opportunity to speak. I actually wanted to, um, pass it to Scott for, sorry, we're in separate rooms and separate Zoom <laughs> uh, screens. Um, so if we could maybe mute me and pass it to Scott, um, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having the public input tonight. We're glad to be here and have a chance to, to tell you our perspective on, on what's been going on and tell you a bit about our neighborhood. Um, Carrie and I and our daughter moved in here about eight years ago, uh, we were in a hurry to buy a house given we were losing our uh, rental place that we had. And I uh, loved this house, which is right next door. 
to the Florence Congregational Church. We loved the church. We liked the neighborhood. Uh, it seemed pretty quiet, a little close to Park Street, but otherwise really nice. And uh, we were happy to move in. It was a little bit of a stretch for us, but it also seemed like a really good investment given, given how big it was and what it was. It's such a beautiful uh, Greek revival house. Um, the neighborhood is great. We've got a lot of friends in the neighborhood and we've enjoyed living here. The church has always been a great neighbor to us and we've tried to be good neighbors to them. We try not to mow our lawn during church service or during weddings or funerals or bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs. Um, and we've really had just about no issues with the church, which has been great. Um, and that's something that's been important to us. And it was something that that was why we decided to live here it's because we had a quiet neighbor who also buffeted, uh, buffered us from the community center and from everything else that was happening a little bit further down Pine Street. Um, things began to change last year, as you know. Um, in the summer of 2021, we did hear from uh, somebody from Bombix through a friend of ours, um, Ido, who I think I saw was on the call. We haven't actually met in person. Hi, Ido. Um, but I think we actually spoke. Is that right, Ido? We spoke on the phone? Uh, yeah, yeah, Scott, yeah. I called you and, and we invited you to come to a few concerts we were having um, in the right. backyard because there was nowhere to hold concerts indoors in the summer of 2021 due to the pandemic. And yeah. yeah. And so we really appreciated the outreach and we said, that sounds fine to us. As I recollect, it was limited to three concerts and uh, we were given a heads up about the dates. And so we said, great. That sounds like a good income source for the church. We knew the church was having trouble and supported uh, trouble financially, I should say. And so we supported that and thought that was a great thing. We didn't actually know that it was a precursor for what came after. And in the fall, last fall, um, when the programming started and suddenly we were having loud bands and uh, lots of people. And as it turned into spring, we saw after the, the COVID uh, surge passed, we saw more and more people coming, people parking on the street, um, people coming to the shows, the shows getting more frequent and louder. Um, we had nights where I would lay in bed on the other side of the house from the church with my earplugs in and I could still hear it. We had nights when programming lasted till after 11 p.m. Um, where people stayed out on the street after the shows till even later. Um, it really changed the feel of the neighborhood and it really changed the feel of our homes. Um, you know, when, when you've got that kind of noise going on in your neighborhood, it, it sort of takes away from you feeling like this is my home and this is safe and it was really quite upsetting. We, um, we hadn't heard anything about this, that this was going to happen. It was really a complete surprise to us. And the only way we learned about Bombix was from the sign on the door and some friends who had actually gone to shows. Um, after a while, we decided that it, it seemed like it wasn't going to just stop, that we needed to do something. And so we reached out to Bombix. We also reached out to the city and spoke with Carolyn at the planning board or emailed with Carolyn. It turns out on the same day that um, Carolyn got our email, it was the same day that uh, she was submitting for this zoning change. Also something we hadn't heard about. And it feels like a zoning change in a property right next door to us is a hugely significant event. Um, I mean, it's hugely significant because of the uses and what the impact is on us as the abutters right next door as well as for the rest of our neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of things that we can't know. We don't know what's going to happen five years from now. Hopefully, Bombix will do well and survive. Um, but if they're not here, who's going to be there and what's the use going to be? That's going to be dictated or at least um, enabled by the zoning changes. So this is really huge to us. And uh, we're very concerned. Um, and I think I want to say that it's it's still a surprise of what of, that this church, which is a wood frame church right next to 
a wood framed house that we live in, all the other wood framed houses on the street, um, that it should be used as a performing arts center doesn't seem like a natural fit. It's, um, it doesn't, uh, most performing arts centers in town like the Calvin or Pearl Street or the Academy of Music are in big masonry buildings that contain their sound quite well. They're also in downtown entertainment districts. The only other place I think around that is in kind of a residential neighborhood or at least on the edge of one that has regular performances is the Arts Trust. And I happen to know that they are going way out of their way to be constructing double walls with an inch and a quarter of drywall and three inches at least of very heavy mineral wool insulation, insulation bats to protect against sound leaking out or conversely sound leaking in. So that the church next door to us is being used for this purpose seems like a not the most natural fit. And the fact that we can hear them uh, so well is kind of testament to that. Now, I sh should mention that we did reach out to Bombix and we heard back from Cassandra and subsequently met with Cassandra and Kyle and some of the members of the board. And we really appreciated their taking the time to talk to us. We've met twice now, and I believe we'll be meeting more, although we don't have any times on the book at the moment. And we talked to them about our concerns and they were very kind and listened to what we had to say. Um, when we've got a lot to say, and it's, I should also mention that it's not just us. There's a number of households in our neighborhood, many of them right now are empty as people are away on vacation and it'd be in the middle of July. So not everybody is on the call, but there are a lot of people who are concerned and who are interested. And a number of them have met with Cassandra and Kyle also. Um, our goal with meeting with Cassandra and Kyle and company was to build a relationship to talk about what our experience is and hopefully to figure out a way to address this going forward so that we can have, we can feel comfortable that our neighborhood is being protected and that our homes, you know, and our feeling of home is being protected. And we also want to make sure that Bombix is successful. I'm sure there's many other uses that the church could be put to that we would like less than having a good organization like Bombix, which is trying to do really good things in trying to save the church and in doing, to, uh, doing the work to build community. Those are fabulous things that we support and like to see succeed. But we also need Bombix to operate in such a way that it doesn't disturb or impact the neighborhood in really significant ways. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that it's been, the finding out of what was happening was hard. The conversations we've had so far have been encouraging. Um, the zoning still is confusing. I wanna thank Rachel and Alex and Stan and Carolyn for their help helping us to understand how this process works and what we're doing. I know that it's been said many times that the licensing process may be critical, um, but I still feel it important to let you know what our experiences are and how we see what's happening on, uh, on, our, on our end. And um, there are still issues that we need to talk about with uh, Cassandra and Kyle. Um, we do appreciate the steps that they've taken so far around parking and around end times for their shows. Um, there are still more things that hopefully we'll be able to work on. Um, we've wondered whether the development agreement was a place where that should happen. I've heard repeatedly that, um, that the planning department feels like that's not the right place. Um, and frankly, I'm not sure, um, but we do uh, hope that we can slow the process down and better understand it. And with that, I wanna hand it back to Carrie. And again, for my part, thank you for, for listening. Thank, Thank you, Scott. You. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so as, as Scott said, we very much appreciate um, working with Cassandra um, and Kyle and their understanding and willingness to work with us. Um, and we fully intend to continue that. Um, but in and of itself, it's not enough. Um, our concerns about the proposed rezoning extend far beyond Bombix's ownership of the church, right? Given, and I, given the long list of possible uses, of the property under office industrial zoning, 
the potential for additional negative impacts um, on the neighborhood from future owners usage is, is substantial, right? On that list are marijuana, marijuana and other types of manufacturing for buildings, you know, built prior to 1939, which obviously include the, the beautiful historical um, church. This includes restaurants, entertainment, commercial recreation, health, athletic clubs, retail, banking, repair services, and community centers. All of those would be allowed, as are many more uses. And while the historic preservation restriction might make some of those uses less likely in a residential neighborhood like ours, it's no um, guarantee whatsoever. So for us, it seems clear without um, more time to work on the development agreement and to work on an, the agreements between the, the neighbors, as Scott said, most of whom are not here tonight. There have been seven households involved in these conversations representing families on Pine Street, Park Street, and Nanatuck. Um, unless and until these, these um, issues can really be hammered out in a thoughtful way um, that considers not just Bombix's ownership, but any future ownerships and, the imp and their impact on the neighborhood, um, it seems clear to me that rejecting the zoning change would provide the best protection for the neighborhood. That being said, um, in considering the rezoning, we have some questions for the city and also some requests. So our questions are that, you know, how, how will the city address the significant negative impacts on abutters and on the neighborhood as a whole, right, as a result of Bombix's current and planned programming, other than having the neighbors sort of contract around it with Bombix? Um, how will the city address the bigger and longer term context of the additional significant negative impacts on the neighborhood potentially caused by future owners use of the property? Um, given the pros the city sees with rezoning beyond the historic preservation of the church, which we understand does not actually require rezoning to be imposed, could they be accomplished in, in other ways that would not require rezoning, but that could meet our needs and also meet Bombix's needs? Um, and then finally, um, I'd be very interested to hear from um, this, the planning department and from the city at large of how this rezoning from residential to office industrial fits within your comprehensive plan. What precedent are you setting longer term? Um, so with that, I just wanted to turn to what our requests are of this committee and also of the, the council as a whole, right, which are to, you know, oppose the rezoning unless and until these significant impacts on our neighborhood can be formally and meaningfully addressed. Um, then we're not there yet. Um, at a minimum, this would require, and this is one of the things we're requesting, that the full city council delay its vote on Thursday on rezoning until the impacts we've experienced, as well as all the future impacts, can really be studied and understood and under and addressed through formal and enforceable, enforceable measures. And two, that we and Bombix have the time to develop and create some enforceable agreements as well on key issues if this is going to go forward. Um, all of which we've mentioned already, right? Frequency of disruptive events, hours of building usage for both entertainment, commercial kitchens, and on and on and on, parking, noise, mitigation, et cetera. Um, and, and I want to also point out that um, in our conversations with the city reps we have met with, they have told us specifically that they want us to, to work with Bombix on this. Um, which is, and so we are doing that. We need more time. Um, and, you know, if it does like go through <laughs> right away, we request that at a minimum, the development agreement include the following conditions, right? Stop all building usage at nine on weekdays and 10 on weekends with a case by case exception process with the appropriate city body. Limit public shows with amplified sound to two evenings per week in the sanctuary. Limit outdoor shows to two per year, two, two per year with um, required outreach to the neighborhood. Um, no marijuana manufacturing, sale or distribution. I think we're kind of like saturated with the dispensaries at this point, and we certainly don't want one next door to us. Um, and even consider something like limiting the rezoning to Bombix's ownership of the property and have it revert to residential with the next owner or require the city to assess and, and address the neighborhood impacts of any prospective future new owner's use of the property before allowing a purchase to proceed. Um, so we, we're asking you to work with us um, and, and give us a seat at the table here. But, you know, mostly, like, I want to ask you all here to put yourselves in our shoes, right? I imagine that some of you, probably many, maybe even all of us here tonight, live in areas that are currently zoned residential. 
so in that sense, this decision potentially affects all of us um, because of the pre precedent it could set. So I want you to just take a minute and I invite you to think about who are your neighbors to the left of you and to the right and imagine that one of those properties is going to suddenly be zoned office industrial and an entertainment venue or even a nightclub with multiple evening shows per month is going to move in. Would you and your family support or oppose that rezoning? If you would support it, like what kinds of restrictions would you want incorporated into the development agreement? Um, you know, and wouldn't you want a seat at the table as among those most directly impacted by the proposed rezoning? And that's really what we're asking for now. We want a seat at the table and in the governing legal arrangements that will impact both the way that we and all of our neighbors are living, potentially our property values, and on and on and on. And, you know, honestly, like we invite you to come sit out on our porch during a loud show at Bombix just to hear what we're experiencing and also to take a look out at the neighborhood um, that the church is located in because it is a residential neighborhood. It's not an industrial, an office industrial neighborhood. So we really, again, thank you for listening to us tonight and considering what we have to share. And um, we appreciate being um, here and part of the process. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I have noted some of your questions. I hope I uh, there were also a number of other things that I hope you will send us by email because it was hard to catch mm -hmm. all of the different things. So if you could do that as well, that would be appreciated. Yeah, we will. Thank you. Um, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll continue to hear from members of the public and then we'll uh, get those questions answered. Uh, Laura, who is next on the list? Um, Delane Hudson. Okay, Delane Hudson. Uh, uh, the floor. Hello, everyone. You want the, this one? You want the, you want the this one. Someone needs to mute. Um, there's a lot of that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Delane. Hi. Can everyone hear me all right? I apologize that my camera is mis misfunctioning tonight. So, yes, um, yes can we can hear you. Um, so everyone's benefit. My name is Delane Hudson. I'm here tonight with my husband, Bruce Frankel, and we live at 111 Nonatuck Street in walking proximity to the church. We've lived at this address and in this community with our daughters since 2013. And we appreciate the opportunity to share our experiences and our concerns with you tonight. Uh, I want to give you a little background on our perspective and why we're here tonight. So we chose our current home in the immediate Florence community based on its comprehensive character. It's residential, family oriented and stable. Residents we've observed have raised children here, including ourselves, the turnover for the most part has reflected the natural evolution of the community. And we are so pleased to see young families moving in now with their children. We believe our house to be a good investment and we've made improvements needed to sustain its value. We first learned of Bombic's presence and the potential sale of the church through our neighbors and friends. They had mentioned the occasional summer performances, and later we learned that these performances had increased significantly in frequency during the fall, often going late at the night, and really it preceded any formal communication or awareness, at least on our part, considering ourselves part of the community. As you've heard tonight, the usage has presented notable hardship to the immediate residents, excess noise pollution, street parking, general loitering of outside guests in this otherwise bedroom community. As we became increasingly concerned about the negative impacts on our neighbors in the broader neighborhood, we also became concerned as residents of this community about the process. Since then, we've joined with our neighbors here, representing multiple households as noted, um, and, and welcome the opportunity and the chance to participate in these conversations and meetings and to allow you to hear our perspective. Here are our concerns. We're deeply troubled about the current proposal to change the zoning of the church from urban residential to office industrial, as well as the general assumption of its passage at this point. We believe that this change would bring significant adverse impact to the area. And it's also understanding that any rezoning request must be evaluated in the context of the broader community planning and Massachusetts law intended to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of present and future inhabitants. Here, we look to Bombix, our city representatives and committees 
to effectively demonstrate to us, the community, how does this proposed rezoning support the comprehensive plan currently in place? Is this rezoning proposal compliant with the recommendations such as noise, traffic, butters, buffers, et cetera? We understand that there are strong considerations and protections being put in place around preservation with the agreement. Nonetheless, also, how would this change have adverse impact on property values? Notably, it's been stated here tonight on more than one other occasion that the church is butted already on two sides by office industrial properties. However, this statement, while factual, it doesn't actually convey an accurate view or position of the property. If one stands on the steps of the church, one clearly observes in panorama the adjacent light residential community. You're looking at predominantly single family homes on normal lot sizes. It would also fundamentally move the buffer to a single family residential home. And finally, is the proposed zoning change in future use of the property appropriate for this location, or is there a more suitable location, like closer to downtown Florence, that could better provide the necessary public services like parking and traffic, et cetera? We ask this committee and the planning board to demonstrate to the residents of this community that these concerns and these considerations have been thoughtfully considered and thoroughly vetted. We do recognize the city's concern regarding historic preservation. We really do. We also recognize the very real challenge of diminished church attendance and the maintenance of historic property. Preservation and reuse of these types of properties as musical or artistic venues is well documented. We also stand the broader social values of these types of reuse. However, these properties, these cases are typically, usually, already within existing zoning permissions. Given the uniqueness of this challenge and close proximity of residents, as the church, the city, Bombex, explored other approaches and usages that would be less disruptive to neighbors. Have the residents been invited to participate in such discussions? We raise these concerns and ask for your response to point out that the current path toward the zoning changes appears, at least so far, to be one of least resistance and correspondingly most likely the least advantageous to all. Certainly, if we were to change course now, it would require significant effort, commitment, and additional creativity, perhaps. The upside, though, is a much stronger and more lasting vision for this community in Florence. And I'd like to close and say, we're here to support, my husband and I are here to support and protect our neighbors in our community. And we unequivocally believe that a musical venue would be a wonderful asset to Florence, just not in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Delane. Laura, who is next? Okay, um, Rose Goldstein Bookbinder. Great, Rose, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rose Bookbinder Goldstein, and I um, reside in Haydenville, but I grew up in Northampton, and I'm here with my two kids. Um, Viva and Bay, and I'm just pointing them out because um, we have spent um, many events at the Bombix, and it's been such an incredible um, opportunity to be able to bring my kids and my mother and our community to cherish in all of the different programming that Bombix has put on. And um, as someone who has studied uh, labor history and social justice movements when I was able to walk into that space where I know Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth met and being able to reunite the community post COVID in that space has been such a valuable part of re-emerging um, into society um, after being so isolated. And um, we are even in the thoughts of buying a new home back in Northampton and I've been really focused on looking in Florence because I would love to be able to walk to that venue and go out to eat at Masa Mexicana or Great Wall and then bring our food over to Bombix and just really um, enjoy what is being um, created there. And just um, a couple of months ago, I went to one of the events where um, both local community members who are musicians plus musicians from Colombia and Mexico 
were brought and walking into a space where there was people speaking Spanish and French and from Springfield and Holyoke and from Northampton, all sharing in that appreciation for music and our community was just has been so valuable and I keep thinking upon that moment and so I'm here to show support for Bombix. Um, it's rare to have spaces that exist as daycares and food spaces and community spaces and music and it's just um, a treasure and I hope that the committee um, approves there um, that this zoning change to keep building upon it and of course I hear the concerns but um, as, as someone who drops my daughter off at dance right around the corner and has left the event early, I haven't heard the music coming out of the venue when the door is shut. So I think that there's creative ways to, of course, prevent, you know, um, sound disturbance to the community, but also hopefully it's not always seen as disturbance, but more as uh, joy, human joy um, existing in that community. And fully maybe the neighbors who feel con who feel that concern and I totally get that as someone who has been concerned about like a Dunkin Donuts going up in my community but now that it's here my kids get to walk over to it and get some donuts and in the end it, it wound up being nice so I just I'm just hoping that um you know while folks are concerned that you can also look at um the ways that it's really going to bring a lot of vibrancy to Florence so that's it Thank you, Rose. And still two other hands, Alexander Pekuchis and Bruce Franklin. Great. Uh, Hi, good evening. Yeah, good Alexander Pekuchis, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Alexander Pekuchis. I live uh, at 113 Nonatuck Street, uh, which is uh, not quite around the corner, but, but a couple blocks away from Bombex. And I'm chiming in and participating tonight in support of Bombex and in support of the committee um, really thoughtfully rezoning um, to make their work possible. Uh, I would say a couple of things, um, which is that while I haven't been involved in the creation of Bombex, I have heard from uh, its early stages and conversations with folks who have been involved in creating it, first and foremost of their level of awareness and consideration about what it would take to create a, a venue and uh, a mixed usage space within a community. And I was impressed as somebody who's a facilitator and a coach and works with communities um, uh, locally and, and, and farther afoot uh, with how thoughtful they were about wanting to really involve the community in a process of understanding how it could work there. And so it's encouraging to hear both from Scott and from Carrie that they've been in conversation with Cassandra, that there's there really clear um, kind of questions and requests about uh, what would need to happen to make this space uh, a good one and a good fit for all people in the community. Um, and it seems from an outside perspective looking in that the, the rezoning allows for that to happen, um, that if you are able to thoughtfully find a path forward, uh, that it allows Bombex and the people from Laudable who are involved to be able to make the retrofits that would be necessary to be able to add uh, sound boards and soundproofing uh, to, to, to maybe mitigate some of the noise that folks have some concerns about. So it, I, I would think that in a path forward um, and knowing how considerate Bombex and others are in this process, that there would be a way um, to thread that needle to both have the center be as vibrant as kind of it is currently and is imagined to be and also addressing community needs. Uh, I thought it was a creative solution that maybe Carrie suggested in terms of rezoning. I don't know if the city has power, but if there's a concern on the part of the residents longer term, well, if Bombex doesn't make it, what comes next? If they don't, that if the city has power and agency to, to be able to have a clause in there, um, that, that if Bombex for whatever reason was not able to continue their work, that it would come back into conversation before another business moved in, that seems like a pretty elegant and creative solution. Um, so I would encourage the city to think about that. Um, from a resident's perspective, I would say that, um, and I, I am not, a, a while I am here at, by myself, um, my wife, my, my daughter who's eight years old, uh, and many of our friends in the community have spoken really highly and feel um, like Bombex is bringing a, a lot of amazing and creative energy to Florence. 
I see people um, in my neighborhood walking to, to the venue uh, when concerts are happening. I hear them, see them talking to each other, uh, very much what you would expect in a congregation and people kind of going on a Sunday um, and meeting up with each other and connections being made. I think that's been a really powerful and wonderful contribution. Obviously, uh, it's not a nightclub. It's not intended to be a nightclub. Um, hearing about the vision of Bombex and the diversity of things that they want to offer to this community, I think is pretty exceptional. I don't know about other folks on this call, uh, having knowing a lot of friends who live in a lot of progressive communities around the country. This seems to be pretty exceptional and a pretty wonderful thing um, and reflects, I think, incredibly well um, on Northampton and Florence. Um, and so having a community center like this, having a venue like this that's holding lectures and also music, I think is a, is a win for our community in Florence. And I also think that it brings, uh, is going to continue to bring people to Florence, which uh, has a net benefit for the, the economy, the local economy, the other businesses that are in Florence, restaurants and shops. Um, so I think all of that is an incredibly great asset uh, for Florence and something that the committee should also consider in making their decision. Um, and, and I think that there's an opportunity here. I know that there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in Florence currently, kind of uh, as Florence has gone through many waves of kind of uh, renaissance, this is one of them. And I'm hearing a lot of stuff as somebody who's connected to the David Ruggles Center uh, and the local history movement, a lot of excitement around what Bombex is bringing as part of the mosaic of things that are taking place now in Florence that are really uh, putting us back on the map as someplace that's doing really unique stuff and walking our talk. So uh, once again, as a community member, I fully support this. I think that the points that Carrie and Scott have brought up, while I don't know them in detail, some of them seem to me to be pretty thoughtful ones. I hope that there's a way for the committee to really recognize and hear those, for those conversations to continue and to make it possible for Bombex to really um, to, to, to do their fullest work, um, which is a, a bigger vision than, than I think a lot of people are hearing in terms of just music. So um, thank you for your time and uh, good night. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I believe Bruce Frankel was next. I think I inadvertently lowered the screen. Okay. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Bruce. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, hi, uh, my name is Bruce Frankel. I live at 111 Nonatuck. I'm Delane Hudson's husband who just spoke. I'm friends with Carrie and Scott, and I'm neighbors with Alexander who just spoke. And I also am a businessman. I'm a local businessman. Um, my business has been in this area and in Florence in the Nonatuck Mill building for the last um, two or three years. So I am right, I am literally a neighbor of this project. I'm a local businessman and I'd like to talk from that perspective. Um, I think there has a lot been said about the value of Bombex and its mission. And I don't disagree with that. I, I think that they could bring a lot of value to this community. I agree with my wife right off that just not in this particular location. So right away, Bombex has great values and it would be a great thing for the community, but not next to one family houses on normal lots. Um, and that being said, you know where I stand, but from a business point of view, Alexander brought up Laudable. And it's strange that nobody's brought up Laudable Productions and all the discussions I've been party to here. Bombex seems to be a, a, a subsidiary or somehow a, um, a franchise of Laudable Productions. Laudable Productions produces music events. They are a for-profit corporation. They have good values as well. They operate a full-blown nightclub in Amherst. Um, and from there, from some article written about their opening, there's something like 250, seating for 250 and, and a huge stage and a full liquor license. And this is great for the middle of Amherst, perhaps, and the community of Amherst welcome them. Maybe it doesn't disturb any residents of Amherst, but just to know what Laudable is about and what I think they're trying to do here. 
This is a future franchise of laudable productions. Bombex is a, a very pretty face that they put on it. I understand. Um, but they're, in my opinion, they'll be looking for a liquor license pretty quickly. And here's why, as a businessman. The present tenants of this property, um, two congregations and a daycare center, seem to have financial difficulties. That's why they've reached out. And there is a big financial burden to keep this property um, viable. And there will be additional financial burdens with the uh, renovations that are needed to bring it up to code and also to keep the sound out. Um, Scott Laidlaw is an architect and he could, he could talk to that probably better than I could, but it's probably a substantial course. It's not a cost. It's not a ma matter of putting up, you know, insulation and, you know, uh, stuffing insulation in the walls. These are major, major renovations that have to be done at, at a substantial cost. And then, you know, um, there, you know, there's also the, um, the operational costs, the marketing and, um, and other things, soundproofing, all the code renovations. Uh, and they have to amortize that over the cost of their business. And I would like to see a business plan from Laudable showing how they can support all of that. Uh, I'm also an ex-restaurateur. I own liquor licenses and um, vitriller licenses in, in different cities. And I understand the responsibility of that. I understand the cost of that. I also understand how the sale of liquor and food um, is fairly profitable. And in my opinion, what Laudable is trying to do here through Bombex is open up a nightclub and a restaurant. And personally, I think that would be a great addition to Florence, but absolutely not this close to a residential neighborhood. Um, and that is where they want the zoning change. So they can make this change to a a restaurant, a nightclub, it seems like the writing's on the wall for that. Um, I don't see how they could make ends meet without having those revenue streams in place. And if they would, in my opinion, if Bombex is willing to say, we'll, we'll not have a liquor license, we will not be doing full scale food service or anything like that, then I would, I would say, okay. Um, I would wanna see how then they would be able to support um, this, the venue, uh, you know, and, and all its costs over time. The other thing is that um, one of the um, other participants talked about how it's great for our community. Um, it's maybe great for our community. Alexander talked about how we saw people walking to the venue. If you look at um, Bombex's website, they advertise quite loudly that we're only five minutes away from I-91. This isn't a community project. This is a project for the region. I-91, that means they want people from Connecticut. And I'm sure they'll try to get people there because they're not trying to, in my opinion, give people wonderful music experiences so much as create a viable business. And from a business point of view, um, that means a lot of crowds, 250 people. How do they plan to lay it out? And what is their goals as far as the scale of their operation? Um, I believe that without a large scale nightclub restaurant operation that they wouldn't be able to make their payments and that this would fail and then we default into, well, what happens now? Um, so it's either it, you know, either there's gonna be a big operation there with lots of cars, lots of people from out of town, people that aren't part of our community and which are insinuating them into people that want just a peaceful life. Um, and or it's not gonna work as a business venture and it's gonna be rezoned for whoever else comes in there. Beside a liquor license, I'm sure at some point we're gonna have social clubs for cannabis. That is going to happen. And if Northampton is gonna be as aggressive with that as it was for dispensaries, then you tell me why there wouldn't be a, a, a social club right there with people buying you know, or using marijuana, you know, right in the premises. And not that I'm against that, you know, um, but it's still not something that should be happening where kids are playing and, um, you know, people have spent their, their lives living and they've invested in, in, in their properties. 
It's just something that is better situated downtown or in really in the industrial district, not on something that borders, you know, residents. Anyway, um, that's what I have to say. That's my perspective. Um, I, I support the mission of Bombex. I just don't support it in this particular location. Thank you, Bruce. Laura, do we have other raised hands? Um, Carrie Cuthbert's hand is raised again, and then Cassandra Holden is a new hand. Okay, we'll go with Cassandra Holden first. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks for joining this meeting tonight. Um, so I just, um, I wanted to speak to a couple of concerns that have come up. Um, so for Bombix, um, the rezoning is actually critical to the financial success of the project. Bombix is a separate 501c3 from Laudable. It has a separate mission. It has its own board. It has, it's a completely different entity. Um, and in terms of the relationship between Laudable and Bombix, Laudable rents space at Bombix in the same way that Valley Classical Concerts rent space at Bombix to present, or the Western Mass Fiddle Orchestra rents space to present, or you know, DSP rents space. Basically, Bombix functions much the way that the Academy of Music does, which is a rental home where various external presenters come in and bring music or dance or theater or you know whatever their particular artistic focus is to the property. In addition, um, we are developing the shared commercial kitchen, which is critical to the financial success of the project also. Um, you know, it, if the building had been able to survive on the income from the two congregations and preschool and the occasional rental of the space for meetings and rehearsals, then the congregation would not have been searching for years to find a buyer who would allow all of those renters to stay and imagine a creative reuse of the property that generated the income to sustain it. Without the change in zoning, this project is not viable and you know ownership will likely revert. I mean, well, the church does own the, on, does own the property. Bombix, you know, in the develop, in the agreement that we have with the church, will exit our agreement and you know the congregation will be left to find another buyer or the building crumbles like these are really the options here where you know we are making our best efforts to be you know good citizens and to communicate with the neighbors and to come to you know reasonable agreements but at the same time we need the security of the zoning change to know that this project is financially viable We've already you know, invested substantial resources. We have secured funding from the Mass Cultural Council to begin renovations, you know, to make the project, you know, to do the upgrades, to meet the code requirements for the project. So you know, I think that the, particularly the concerns raised by Scott and by Kerry can be dealt with through licensing and through informal agreements with the neighborhood. We've had two you know, very positive conversations where people have been able to share concerns. We've responded to those concerns with solutions around changing the timing of programming, both the programming booked by Laudable and the programming booked by other entities. We've also you know, developed signage and begun implementing um, you know, different procedures to minimize the parking impacts in the community. We're also looking ahead to, you know, monitoring the sound impacts in the community and then looking at mitigating those impacts. Obviously, some of that mitigation will take, you know, will evolve over a longer horizon as we're learning about what we can do in the building to do that. Um, but I really want to reiterate again that this change of zoning is critical to the success of the project. If the fear expressed by the community is that this could become something ultimately undesirable, if Bombix doesn't thrive, then it seems like perhaps there is some you know, creative uh, clause that could be added to the development agreement. Um, and I'm certainly open to that. Um, our, the Bombix board president and I are meeting with Carolyn tomorrow morning to review the development agreement and to understand you know, what we can and can't do and what adjustments might make sense. Um, and I think, you know, finally, I just want to point out that, you know, a lot of the negative impacts have been articulated 
in this conversation, but there's also a lot of good that's happening that, you know, when there are gatherings at Bombix, whether that's, you know, whether that's music programming, whether that's, you know, the equity conference that we held um, not quite a month ago, you know, whether that was, you know, the health convening that was held back in May, you know, the local restaurants see a bump, like this has a positive economic impact on the community, but it's also bringing people together, you know, post COVID, there's this real hunger in the community to reconnect and, you know, to, to see each other again, you know, to be in conversation, to share space, to share time with each other in a way that hasn't really been accessible. And I think the value of that cannot be understated. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Was um, there anyone else who I would like to address the questions that have been asked before anyone who hasn't spoken uh, speaks? Is there anyone who, or who, who's already spoken rather speaks again? Um, is there anyone? Okay. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, if you could state your name, and I realize since this is a public hearing, we do require that people uh, state their address as well. Great. Um, so I'm Lama Maynard. Um, I am currently not a Northampton resident. I was for the last 11 years. My mother is a resident on Perkins Avenue in Northampton, and my mother-in-law is a resident on Straw Avenue in Florence. Um, and I want to... Um, just voice a vignette tied to Cassandra's last comment about um, the incredible value of the cultural experience that Bombix in its present location um, has brought to my family. Um, it, our experiences at Bombix as attendees um, really have been intergenerational um, where my children um, myself, my husband, and um, my mother-in-law, you know, will walk together um, from her house in Florence, and um, being able to come to a you know beautiful historic site um, that is seeing this um, vibrancy in the community um, and and a gathering of um, so many local people is what I often see. Um, it really has been a powerful uh, place for our family. And my children love it. They know um, the historical significance of the building um, and they feel at home in the space. Um, and uh, you know that, that value isn't a monetary value. It's a value about this specific location um, and having this embedded in the community. And again, that, you know, the neighborhood feel uh, is what allows you know, us to experience it coming off of the bike path. Um, I live in Haydenville, so we, we can bike in um, and again, meet my mother-in-law from Florence and, and um, you know, just wanna give voice to um, how much we and my mother-in-law and mother as well, you know, really value um, the work and the, and the cultural um, investment that's happening in this historic space. I don't know how the space would be uh, used this richly and the building, you know, invested and held up um, without this type of commitment um, from the Bombix organization, which, as Cassandra pointed out, is its own, you know, board governed organization um, separate from Laudable, I understand. So thank you for um, hearing my comment. Thank you, Emma. Any other people who haven't already spoken? Okay, so let's take some of the questions. Um, so I wrote down, how will the city address the negative impacts on the neighborhood? Uh, how does this fit within the comprehensive plan? Do, Carolyn, would you be able to address those? Sure. Um, Alex, would it be possible to add another public comment? Um, I'm sorry, he was one of the... Oh, okay, yes. Uh, Ido, uh, yes, go ahead. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Thank you everyone uh, for giving me an opportunity to add my thoughts and feelings uh, today to the conversation. My name is Ido. I live on 32 North Farms Road in Williamsburg, just up the road from Florence uh, and really identify with Florence more as my neighborhood than uh, Haydenville, Williamsburg because all my friends live there. It's where I go to the post office. It's where I go to Cooper's. Um, my parents live in the area and they own a property on Fruit Street in downtown Northampton. 
Um, so my, my community is effectively in Florence and Northampton, if not uh, where I reside. Um, additionally, I should explain, um, I have been working with Laudable Productions for the past five years. Uh, I first met Colin Cassandra because I heard of, of the incredible um, cultural work they do in East Hampton with a festival called Mill Pond Live, where they activate this park once a year and it becomes a place for people to gather from, uh, from different parts of East Hampton and have an experience that I think is really singular and intergenerational and unique. And I met them through that. I started working with them to help them uh, more on the, on the creative talent buying side of, of what Laudable Productions does, which is what kind of artists are we bringing to the Valley? Um, and I've found them to be incredibly thoughtful and caring in that process. Um, they uh, have struck me over the years as the kind of people who, number one, they're not in it for the money. Number two, uh, they uh, really try to communicate with all parties when they uh, work um, in, in new projects they're engaged in. Um, and, and three, I think that their core values align so well with the history of this building that when I heard, I, I try to often talk them out of crazy ideas, but when I heard um, the kind of the, their vision for the space, I really felt like it was fitting um, and could lead to becoming a really rich um, addition to the community of Florence and the broader Valley. Um, I think I remember talking to Kyle last fall and, and asking him really, you know, are you really doing this? Why, why, why do you want to do this? And he told me, um, that growing up in Northampton, he did not um, know the history of Sojourner Truth, did not know the history of this area at all, and that uh, to find it, that, that it, it was kind of sitting there among us, but it wasn't anything that the community understood or had a way to interact with, made him want to create Bombix. Um, so I really, I, uh, I respectfully disagree with the idea that we're the Lotto Productions has created an organization called Bombix to start a nightclub in Florence. That uh, seems kind of ludicrous to me. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, all the neighbors near Bombix and fully understand their concerns. Uh, Carrie, Scott, uh, Bruce, and uh, Delane as well. Um, and I think that when I think back to last fall when Bombix opened, uh, I think that there was and there could have been more communication um, I think that there was a lot of stress involved in when the project started and uh, that my, my partners and friends are just human beings. And I think, you know, uh, we're dealing with so many different things on so many fronts that they, they didn't find a way to do this as best as they could have. Um, but I know that they've come around to really trying to figure out how to do this with the neighborhood to make it work for everybody. Um, which I feel is ultimately essential to this project. Um, and I really wanna kind of bring this, I guess I should, I should address one more point that uh, Bruce made about uh, Laudable Productions uh, and the Drake in Amherst, um, because I program music that happens at the Drake. And I want, I want to really um, emphasize how different the two locations are and the fact that uh, Laudable Productions can curate a particular kind of music at the Drake and can do something completely different uh, at Bombix is, is kind of uh, the magic here is really we can think of an artist that aligns well with the values of Bombix, with the church space, um, with the spiritual nature of the place. And we have a place to bring that artist to the Valley, present them to the Valley audience. Uh, we wouldn't be possible without Bombix. Um, and we've, we're moving more towards an ability to do that because the Drake allows us to present completely different artists uh, that fit better in a nightclub. Um, I think uh, I just I just want to also add uh, to other comments made by Bruce that uh, the the way that an organization like Bombix raises money to uh, fund itself and to keep this building from becoming a huge question mark for the community and the surrounding houses is through nonprofit, it's nonprofit nature, the application of grants, the Mass Cultural Council, ARPA funds that are on the way. And so there's a lot of ways for this to be a really powerful 
important and uniting space for the community without it becoming uh, a nightclub or a marijuana dispensary, as was suggested, which again feels quite ludicrous to me. Um, I think uh, I'm going to turn it over and I hope um, I adjust everything. Thank you. Thank you, Ido. Uh, Carolyn, do you want me to restate those questions? Yeah, absolutely. So let's well, actually, yeah, we'll, let's take a short recess. Okay, welcome back. We are back from recess. Um, and uh, Carolyn, you, uh, are you ready to address those questions? I think I'll start with the um, Sustainable Northampton Plan. And um, first to say that um, zoning um, amendments or map changes really need to be um, considered in the context of the overall land use plan. Um, and you can't, um, you really um, shouldn't be making um, map changes without evaluating the plan and just plunking new districts within the middle of another district unless the plan says, hey, you know, this is an area where, where we want to expand. Um, and that's important to think of in the context of the boundary of this and knowing that um, this um, parcel is um, next to an office industrial district. And so expanding that boundary isn't creating, you know, an island of this zoning. But going to the text of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, there are um, many objectives under the, specifically under arts and culture um, that um, are, uh, objectives and policy statements about um, where about supporting arts and and bringing um, and increasing um, public and private support for arts and cultural organizations, um, building part new partnerships with nonprofit organizations, and expanding the presence of those. Um, functions to the community because that's such an important piece of our um, city and representative of, of what Northampton is. And so um, 
I would say that the rezoning is really targeted in the whole and actually sort of going back to why we have a provision in the zoning in the first place to protect um, architectural um, um, resources that are a component of those arts and cultural resources. Um, we've had that on the books for many years because of um, the interest in the city to protect those resources. And so there are um, lots of areas um, or sections of the ordinance that speak to um, trying to create new strategies that help support those resources. This zoning um, is one mechanism to do that. We, as I mentioned before, um, there this is really targeted towards uh, the current zoning that in the urban residential districts um, and the downtown districts that allow for the flexible reuse of um, schools and church buildings that are becoming or have become vacant. Uh, was established, as I said, specifically to encourage the reuse of those buildings. So it's it's not something that can be applied to any structure in a district. It's really focused on the ones that are hard to reuse. And so I, I think there was a comment about, um, well, this could happen, a rezoning could happen anywhere in any neighborhood. And, and that's the difference with this. This is really targeted as a, a way that ties in our interest in supporting arts and cultural resources in the city, but which includes helping to preserve um, architectural resources. And then in terms of the uses and how we can address this sort of negative impacts, um, first I wanna say, um, office industrial does not allow um, dispensary uses or retail sales of marijuana. It's about um, cultivation and, um, and production, which is allowed in office industrial, but not the sales. So that would not be part of this zoning. Um, there are also many um, parameters around cultivation that are necessary from, um, there are lots of permissions that are required to be obtained by anyone who's interested in even establishing a cultivation facility. Plus you need physical space that um, supports that. So again, having this sort of unique structure of a church would probably not lend itself um, very well to then creating a place for um, manufacture of, of um, cannabis. In terms of the noise, I wanted to address that because that came up a lot in the planning board conversation as well as I think a little bit in cultural resources, uh, I'm sorry, community resources. Um, the noise um, standards are the same no matter what zoning district you're in. So it's based on the use and the hours. And there are, depending on the use, there are a little bit, there's a little bit more leeway in terms of the sound. But um, no matter where um, you are in the city, <coughs> the noise ordinance is applicable. And it is, um, it's, it's hard to enforce in that, you know, you have to be able to contact building code enforcement officer in the moment and measurements are taken over an hour period to determine if there is a steady, you know, non-fluctuating noise that exceeds the threshold levels in um, the ordinance. In the scenario that um, has been presented to the council where Bombix would um, uh, need an entertainment license and also um, for liquor sales, which has always been part of the equation because they have sought liquor licenses from the license commission. The license commission is in a much, I would argue much stronger position to revoke a license if there are consistent and problematic issues with noise, with um, any kind of um, violations of the license that's granted by the um, license commission. Whereas under zoning, it's, it's much harder to, um, to both enforce and then sort of the longer period to pull that back. You can't revoke 
um, a use in the zoning district, but you can revoke a license. So um, I think that's a stronger um, mechanism to, um, to help um, attenuate those concerns. Um, I think, um, let's see, there was another issue that came up um, that I don't think I addressed that you asked about, I think. Um, well, there's the question of can rezoning be limited to just one owner? Right, right, right. So no, zoning is about a, a geographic boundary in which a certain um, um, category of uses are allowed. And so there's a uniformity that's required to be applicable to all uses. Now, development agreements are a different animal in that that's a private agreement that someone could um, impose on themselves to say, you know, this pro I'm going to I'm going to restrict my property that I own not to, um, you know, have this use. But it can't be done through zoning, um, and so and so it can't and it can't be tied to a specific person or entity either. Right. Um, so there was a question about have residents been invited to participate in this process? I am. I, I think it is clear that residents have been invited to participate in the city council's process in terms of the multiple uh, two public hearings and the um, uh, another committee meeting. Um, but perhaps the question was uh, was about the development agreement itself, uh, which is is just a private process, a private agreement between the city and the owners. Is that? The, how the, can you explain how the public can have input into that process? Yeah, I mean, I think the what's uh, what's happening now with the um, neighbors, the immediate neighbors communicating with Bombex about their concerns and about how those may be addressed is the um, is the appropriate mechanism for that to happen. Develop. I mean, Bombex isn't going to sign a development agreement that will. Um, create such a burden that will not allow them to function that that will make them in a way that will make them successful. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important to understand that there is a balance there that they are clearly have shown that they're listening and um, take these concerns seriously. Um, but they also need to um, have an um, understanding that they're, they won't be restricted to such a great extent that they can't function there. Um, I think a lot, again, sort of a lot of the issues do go back to noise and sound attenuation, and um, that certainly can be addressed through licensing. Thank you. Um, I think I summarized the questions that I heard. Uh, that we'll now go back uh, and hear from members of the public again. Um, and uh, so, Carrie Cuthbert. Yeah, hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I just, um, this is really helpful. And I, I just wanted to um, appreciate what Rose and Alexander and, and Nama um, shared about the value of uh, Bombix's programming. Um, I, I think. Um, if I'm hearing everybody correctly, we are all in agreement about the, the cultural value of uh, and the mission of Bombix, right? So, I, and, and also with the uh, need to preserve the historic nature of this church um, and all the history that um, it has there. Um, I think where, I just wanna just emphasize where we're different or where we, is that, you know, while like Rose and um, Yama's families live in Haydenville, Alexander, even down on Nanatuck, like that's different than living next door or even one door down um, or across the street. And so um, I wanted to just, I guess, reiterate that my request is that we slow this process down and not vote on the rezoning on Thursday. The clay is still wet in the sense that um, all of the stakeholders needs have not yet really been had the oxygen we've needed to kind of hammer it out, you know, whether it's the development agreements. An informal or formal neighbor uh, agreement with the neighbors and Bombix or even the time for us as residents and maybe Bombix i'm not sure um, to understand the licensing 
framework available to us. So I think we need a little bit more time to be able to have the guardrails on Bombix's use of this property and also to really think through thoughtfully um, the potential future uses by future owners um, so that we can make this, assuming it goes through, you know, as, as um, less adversarial as possible. And I think the city has an, an interest there, right? Because the way I'm hearing it is as residents, the burden of addressing the noise, the parking, et cetera, is really on us. And that's through the complaint process um, or through calling, you know, the police and at, at, like after hours, if I understand it correctly. And I want to just be really clear that that's the last thing we want to do. Like we do not want to be doing that and we don't want to use the city's resources that way. So give us time and some oxygen to get the pieces in place to make this workable if you are gonna move forward with rezoning, if the city will go forward with it, but don't do it until then. So at least you know, offer us that to come up with some thoughtful and creative and meaningful um, ways to get every all the stakeholders um, needs met here. Great, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Laura, do we have any other hands? No. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so the way this process works is next we will decide whether to close the public hearing or if, if there are any other questions from counselors for Carolyn, uh, we could take those before we do that. Stan. Yes, I wanted Carolyn to, to address, um, there were two, um, two suggestions made during public uh, comment. One was a neighbor who said that she believed that um, the planning department felt that the development agreement was not the proper place to address some of the neighbors concerns about noise traffic hours of operation and so forth uh and then cassandra uh, later uh, asked uh about perhaps adding a creative clause to the development agreement i think in the context of of wanting to address some of those concerns so can, can you talk about about what, what you're feeling about how creative you could get in the in the development agreement. Uh, um, development agreement can have almost anything in it. Um, I think the there had been conversations back and forth over the last couple of months about adding. Um, time restrictions or noise restrictions into a, the development agreement component um, sort of self-regulating but again that is a longer road to enforcement than a license agreement so i mean a license um, that's granted so a license again so licensing licenses can be revoked revoked temporarily revoked you know whatever the um i don't know all the details about the licensing process um, and so that seems to be perhaps a more targeted tool that would be more appropriate than um, the enforceability of um, a development agreement. It's not that it's not enforceable, it's just gonna be harder to enforce. Um, so I think what I heard um, Cassandra say about um, creative um, uh, language in the development agreement, was in the context of restricting potential future uses, um, but I may have I may have misheard that because you may have heard something different. But that certainly it, it, you can restrict uses in a development agreement. So Bombix could include you know a list of uses that would not be um, allowed. And, and you would be more comfortable with that than uh, specifics about time and other operating conditions. Um, I, yes, I think it's easier to enforce that. Any other questions from counselors? Jim. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in, all right, so, Alex and I have been through this before around the noise ordinance and stuff. And that, so the enforcement for the noise ordinance is the building department, is that correct? Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, it's the um, 
the licensing board that could have a say over whether or not a venue is too loud and suspend a liquor license. And it's, it's just gone on, it, it, what I'm seeing is how the two aren't really tied together and that, um, and that there are um, decibel levels or noise levels that can be measured that become data um, much in the way we did data fact finding on the proposed animal control facility where we projected noise over a distance to see what it's like. Um, it's all to say that if, if there's a way to quantify things so that, um, uh, that neighbors protections are like, yeah, we have a noise ordinance that's quantifiable in this particular way. And if it goes above this threshold, then yeah, then either the building inspector or the liquor or the, the license commission will have something to say about it. Otherwise, you haven't reached that threshold. Um, and, and, and I'm thinking if there were mechanisms in place like that, that, that would be helpful. Um, I have seen the, uh, the licensing commission be really effective. When Jim, your mic's not on. Oh. Hopefully they could still hear it, could still hear you. Well, I'm so loud usually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can hear me all the way out in Florence. <laughs> uh, that, um, yeah, I, I've seen that as a mechanism for really uh, for uh, addressing noise complaints from a club. And, um, and so, all right, so within that, there was, a, this is an entertainment venue and, and it was mentioned this idea of a, of it becoming a club or, you know, it, what is the difference between the two that, you know, I think sometimes it's hard to figure out, you know, that, um, and, I mean, if I go to the Iron Horse and I, they have a bar and there's beer and I'm thinking this looks like a bar to me and, but it could be a performance venue. Maybe that's what it is. And how is that different from uh, the the watering hole? <laughs> I, I'm just in terms of what, and 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 I think having that clarified for neighbors, like you know, oh, it's a performance venue. This is what's going to, you know, that the performances stop at a certain time. They can't be open till two in the morning or whatever. I, I haven't shut down a bar in a while. I don't know how late. <laughs> <laughs> From there, so there's two pieces to it. There's the the zoning and the land use piece, and a lot of that is becomes very gray. I'm not sure that you could necessarily distinguish between the two, um, except that um, you know there might be more or less seating in one because maybe maybe a club is more like a dance club or something like that, and it's less. That, but I think the distinction really is um, comes with the licensing because you need a licensing for, I think you need an entertainment license and you need a liquor license if you're going to be serving and there's different types of those. And I'm not going to pretend to know what each of those levels are. Right. Um, but, you know, so the use part is just saying, okay, there are going to be performances, there might be food served. Um, and all of that is allowed in an historic building in office industrial. Then there's the approval of a license to sell tickets to come to a venue and then to sell alcoholic beverages. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the piece that can be modified pretty um, directly and regularly, it's not a permanent grant of the use. And so you might be able to have, um, you know, um, a show, um, where you are selling tickets, but not being able to sell alcohol, alcoholic beverages. And, um, it's still considered from a zoning perspective, it's the same thing, but your licenses might just be different. Um, so we have attorney Seawald, solicitor Seawald with us. And um, so I had a question about, you know, the, the revocation of a license. So we have these two licenses, potential paths for a license. There's the, the license commission, which would regulate uh, in, in the case of liquor. 
um, or alcohol of any kind. Um, and then we have the mayoral entertainment license, which is the mayor's office. And uh, could you give us an idea of, you know, when is it appropriate to revoke such a license? Um, and, and that, so yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, councillors. Um, so uh, once uh, a liquor license is involved, there will no longer be any mayoral license. That license will now be an entertainment license issued by the License Commission. And uh, this, the, uh, the statute upon which the License Commission issues those licenses um, sets out a number of um, circumstances in which a, an entertainment license can be denied or uh, revoked or suspended. Uh, the, the statute also points out that entertainment is a First Amendment uh, protected activity. So unless a clear finding, and it's gonna be the city's obligation to show that there is, that one of those circumstances has arisen or will arise from the use, um, the presumption is that the license will issue. So if the burden is not on the applicant to show that it won't happen, the burden is on the city to show that it will or it, it has. And so that's the licensing process. And I will say that unnecessary disturbing noises in the neighborhood is definitely one of those circumstances upon which a license can be denied, suspended or revoked. Great, thank you. That's a paraphrase from the statute. That's not obviously, I, I'm not reading the statute right now. But we had this come up in, in the center of Florence um, with the outdoor entertainment at um, this Flows, the, the bar there. JJ's? Yes, JJ's. Okay. Other questions? Jim. Yeah, one more quick one, and, and, and it's because we have this development agreement going along with the zoning change, and just to, so if the if the owner moves on, the development agreement stays with the property for the duration of the the thirty years for that. Or, yeah, so what 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 it's making it expire after thirty years is that historic, the, the restriction can only last for 30 years. Correct. So, but that doesn't, so if a new owner comes in, there doesn't need to be a new development. No. Okay. Jim, just a reminder to turn your mic on when. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Is that hand up, Cassandra Holden? Yep, we'll take that. Go ahead, Cassandra. Hi, thanks again. Um, I realized I didn't say it the first time. Uh, my name is Cassandra Holden. I live at uh, 408 North Farms Road in Florence. Um, so just a couple of words about like where where that is in Florence. So, you know, we I'm I live past Fitzgerald Lake and I have a farm on one side of me and both of my neighbors operate heavy equipment. Um, so, you know, it's quite normal for someone to be driving a tractor or dump truck or bucket loader at 7 a.m. in the morning. And that like that happens around, you know, that happens around me a lot and in this neighborhood quite a lot. And, you know, I think that, you know, there's, um, you know, with that, there's a certain acceptance of like different types of activity that come you know, part and parcel with, you know, with these different types of uses. Like I would much rather have my neighbor across the street operate his tractor at 7 a.m. and that that farmland stay like open and farmland than that turn into, you know, the next expensive development in this town. Similarly, you know, both of my, you know, my other two neighbors own large parcels of land. And while you know, I don't love getting woken up at 6 a.m. by a dump truck or, you know, the jackhammering of rocks. That's a thing that happens. And again, like I would rather, 
those properties and that land and those uses be retained, then this turn into, you know, a different kind of neighborhood that's more tightly controlled. And I, you know, thoroughly respect the concerns that the neighbors have articulated, you know, in the the Pine Street neighborhood. And, you know, as I've said, you know, we we are committed to working with them, to meeting with them, to hearing those concerns and responding to them. And finding, you know, finding the compromise where, you know, Bombix has the flexibility to operate and to be financially viable, um, but also that we, there is the flexibility in that, that, you know, to put a fine point on it, like there are many other types of uses that, you know, could be imagined there that are more destructive to the neighborhood, you know, ultimately like, if that building crumbles as many churches have and do and are like that's a that's a profound loss for the community as well and you know we're really committed to finding a solution as carolyn has articulated i think that you know really comes in the licensing process for us you know this change in zoning is critical because that you know that's the gateway to our future to this being a project that can be successful um, and I wanted to speak to a couple of other points that came up. Again, much like the Academy of Music, you know, we serve alcohol at select events and we apply for permits for those select events. The majority of our events do not involve the serving of alcohol. Um, you know, it's, it's only at the events like where that makes sense. So it winds up being a couple of events a month. Um, it's not something that's happening every week or every day by any means. Um, and also, you know, in our conversations with the neighbors and in our own process, you know, we're looking at measuring sound levels, collecting that information, and really, you know, understanding what that means in different parts of the neighborhood. Last summer, when Laudable held five concerts outside, um, you know, that was sort of a, a precursor to understanding like, you know, what it, what it might be like to have events in this space and in this community. Um, and we did walk around and we did, you know, measure sound levels at different distances from the property. And in that scenario, when we were having concerts outside, the noise on the street, like if you were standing on Pine Street, it was the traffic that passed by through that intersection with Park and Pine was actually louder than the music that, you know, standing at that sport, than louder than what you could hear in the backyard. Um, certainly, you know, that that was different at different, you know, different places within, you know, essentially a quarter mile radius of the property. And so, you know, we really want to look at that and understand it. Um, but again, I would really encourage like the flexibility in, you know, in our ultimate arrangement with the neighborhood and with the city so that we can create a project that's financially viable. Bombix has already committed to essentially encumbering the property and that you know, part of our agreement with the Florence Congregational Church is that they continue to operate there. And once Bombex becomes the owner of the property that they would have a 99 year lease. So it will continue to be sacred space. Similarly, you know, we have made commitments to Beta Hava that they can continue to use the space as sacred space and um, that Cloverdale can continue to operate there. They've been, you know, they've been operating their preschool since the seventies. So we're not trying to turn this into a nightclub or a restaurant or, you know, that kind of a thing. Like really this is meant to be a community center with these multiple uses. Um, and we were an attractive partner for the Florence Congregational Church because we agreed to those things they actually had other buyers who were interested in the property who made it very clear that neither of the congregations would be able to stay and that the preschool would not be able to stay and that they were interested in developing that property in different ways that were perhaps you know, less valuable, less valuable to the neighborhood and you know, less valuable to the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing and then we can discuss uh, that if we are ready to do that. I will move to close the public hearing. Second. Okay, discussion on closing the public hearing. Jim. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty mixed on it in that um, we're still waiting for the uh, development agreement and um, and that um, and it sounds like there is some productive discussion that's still going on uh, to uh, between uh, neighbors and Bombix. Um, and I and and I'm hearing I think I'm hearing from both sides that um, oh for, let me say all sides that possibly a little more time it, uh, would be helpful mm -hmm. and that in that uh, keeping the hearing open would be one mechanism to do that. The, the other way to do that would be to send it to council and then council could choose to table it for a month while we wait for more information. That could be another way. So, um, but I, I, but I, 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 and I don't like waiting. <laughs> I, I like voting, but in this case, I, I, I my sense is that all around that uh, delaying the vote might be the best thing to do. So that's why I would possibly keep it open with the idea that that would be a, a, a mechanism to create more time. Stan. Uh, I agree, uh, uh, Jim, with delaying the, the voting by the full council. And in fact, my, uh, if, if we close the public hearing, my, my next motion would be to send it on to council uh, with a positive recommendation with the provision that um, the council delay a vote until the development agreement is in place, signed, and can be part of the deliberation by the entire council. I, I, but if, if you have a reason that you think keeping the public hearing open is a better way forward than I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen to that. I'm not sure I do. I'm just throwing the question out there that in terms of the different mechanisms that we have, I, I, I actually like your idea, Stan. I, I think that's, that's a good way to go. So, so I, I think I'd be okay closing the hearing. <laughs> Marissa, do you want to weigh in? Um, I guess I, I, I guess this, so. This is a question for uh, for the Bombex people. It would would delaying uh, would what what outcome or what would what would be any? Would, are there any issues with delaying from your perspective? Um, is there something that you couldn't do? And I am directing this to Cass Cassidy since she's right on our, our screen, I guess. Yep, the public hearing is still open, so we can hear from Cassandra. Cassandra. Hi again. Sorry. Um, so to answer your question, um, so summer programming at Bombix is a bit of a challenge because the sanctuary space is not air conditioned. And um, we... Um, had been looking at, you know, there were several groups who were interested in presenting music outside. However, it's my understanding and that until we are fully licensed by the city, that's, that's not an option for us. Um, so, um, so I, I think I'm of, uh, I stand with one, one foot on either side here, because on one hand, I really see the value of taking the time to you know, work through the, the details of the licensing and an informal agreement with the neighbors and moving that process forward. You know, on the other hand, I'm also aware of, you know, the potential of losing rentals and therefore revenue um, because, you know, programming, you know, because of this, we're sort of in this limbo space, you know, programming needs to be entirely inside and the building is, hot and not especially comfortable. And then there's also the factor that, you know, with the recent uptick in COVID cases, um, it's certainly true that a lot of people are uncomfortable coming to programming inside and more comfortable coming to programming that's held outside. Um, so, so moving forward, like, 
feeling, you know, having the zoning change in place sooner rather than later would give, would provide for us a sense of financial security because then we could also move ahead with the finalization of the commercial kitchen and begin, you know, renting that out and collecting that revenue, which is important to the building. You know, on the other hand, I think it's also important to continue this process, which sounds like it's better addressed through the licensing procedures around, um, you know, sound attenuation and parking mitigation and traffic and those things. So, so to summarize, because I've been kind of long-winded here, um, it seems like moving forward with the zoning quickly is important. And then the place where we would take our time is in the licensing, because that's really where we're working out the details of these impacts in the neighborhood. A question. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a you know appropriate. I just it might be helpful to understand what the dates are for city council meetings and what you're thinking about in terms of continuation. So I know you have a meeting Thursday this Thursday, but when does your legislative matters committee meet again versus when would the next council meeting be? So we're scheduled for August eighth. Is the second Monday um, for our next legislative matters. And then the, the council is, is it August 18th? Yeah, August 18th. So you would have another legislative matters meeting before the next council meeting if you didn't take it up yes. on Thursday at council. And I think the question we're addressing right now is whether we need to hear more, we need more information from the public um, before we feel ready to make a recommendation. And we should hold the public hearing open if that is the case. Um, so that, that's the, would holding the it, motion. I'm sorry, um, would holding it open preclude us from, from voting to recommend tonight or would it would. automatically continue to the next meeting? It, we would continue it. We, we could not deliberate or vote on it tonight. I, I, I'm, I'm prepared to vote tonight. I, I, I think I'm prepared to vote tonight. So for what it's worth, um, I think there's going to be further opportunity. There's going to be further opportunity for input or um, to slow it down within the council. I, I would hate to see it roll over to a second legislative. I mean, because we don't know how the rest of the council is going to feel on Thursday and um, and whether or not they're going to agree with that. And I personally don't. Um, don't, I'm ready to vote. Okay. Any other, uh, any other, anyone else like to speak to the motion? Okay. I will speak to it. Um, so I feel we've, we've heard from, uh, the public quite a bit. I certainly, I certainly have in terms of the meetings that I've had. So I feel comfortable uh, closing the public hearing. I think we've heard quite a bit tonight as well. Um, that doesn't preclude the council or even this body. If we, I mean, we could close the public hearing and then decide to not make a recommendation tonight. That's another option that we have. Um, but that, that this, uh, that doesn't preclude the council from uh, taking the information, new information in, um, in terms of what the development agreement and input from, from the public in, in making that decision. Um, that said, no, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't like us to I'll vote as a council on this this Thursday. I think that it is important to to let delay um, to, to August. Um, and that, you know, that I think that that I hope that the council would be uh, receptive to that that um, continuing, um, because by default, if we make a recommendation tonight, it will show up on that agenda. Um, so I would be comfortable closing the public hearing at this point. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Councilor Moulton. Um, yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Garrett. Yes. And Councilor Elkin. Yes. Okay, the public hearing is closed, and um, I would entertain a motion on a recommendation. Stan, since I promised my colleague, uh, my recommendation, my uh, my motion is that the that this uh, be sent back to the full council with a positive recommendation, with with the provision that a vote 
uh, not be held by the full council until the development agreement is available for to be part of that deliberation. So I, I'm that's the motion. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. So my my reasoning is to concur with you. I think that the the vote by the full council needs to be delayed until August. And I don't think based on what Carolyn has said that the development agreement will be ready for this Thursday. I, I don't. Your microphone's off. It seems um, fast given that we're meeting tomorrow. Right. So in what this means in reality is that we're um, we're moving it with a positive recommendation, but it won't go to the full council until August 18th. Or that is our recommendation to the council. We don't, we can't actually, uh, you know, yes. demand that of the council, yes. but we recommend. Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, discussion on that positive recommendation with that provision. I'm good with it. <laughs> Um, I'm in favor of the positive recommendation, but I would not on the, I, I think the, the, I think that the things that are going on that will, uh, in the conversation, both, you know, to the extent that Bombex is in conversation with its neighbors and conversation that's going on around um, um, the development contracts are happening. I, I would hate to see uh, I'd hate to see Bombex lose opportunities uh, to, that could make it have a more viable summer um, by waiting uh, to August. The season will be over. So, I mean, the council may not go along with it, but I, I would not, I don't, I would just give it, a, I would send it forward with a positive recommendation without the, yeah. without the caveat about the agreement. So with regard to the, so the provisions of the, okay, my understanding, I was just talking with former director Fiden, sad to say that, those words, um, was that the planning department will give a positive, give the council a positive recommendation with a signed development agreement on this zoning change. Is that accurate? Um, as I said at the beginning, I think that it makes sense that, that yes, there'd be a signed development agreement and that's the way it's drafted is that the signed development agreement before the council takes action on the request for zoning. So Marissa, does that, I mean, I think, you know, is the intention of the sponsor to not have us move forward until there is a signed development agreement that, that. Stan's motion does not preclude, like if there happens to be one on Thursday, we could vote on it, um, uh, you know, and there would, the positive recommendation would apply. Uh, so I'm wondering if that addresses your concern. Um, um, I guess, that, well, so the thing is, is that that provision was uh, done before the you know, the reality of the timeline and, and, you know, before events played out. And I guess I'd want to hear in the, in the larger council on Thursday, a more, by that time, they will have had an opportunity to say, we're here, we're this close, we're that close, we're miles apart, whatever, sorry, uh, whatever the case may be. And we could hear what the ef effects of delaying could, could, could be. Uh, I'm just happy to reserve that question notwithstanding um, and and I don't I don't I don't really want to put a stamp from this committee uh, that makes that seem like uh, I mean it's just not a deal breaker per se for me I, I can be persuaded to 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 delay I, I I think there are good reasons we're hearing kind of both things from both from all sides no, I, and mm -hmm. I, but, um, I I I think that that provision was was done before the timeline played out. And so I just don't want to be bound by it. And I, I think there could be good reasons um, to go ahead and move ahead. If we, the other thing I guess I would say is if we were in a situation where we were in, not in summertime and waiting a month between um, city, between council meetings, you know, maybe I'd feel differently, I guess. Uh, but 
as it is, uh, summer will be just about over before we, we come back. So I just don't want to put a, a stamp of an infrastructure on, from this committee when folks are still open, but that's that's my take on it, so. Thank you. Stan? Okay. Um, I guess I'm willing to, uh, to uh, withdraw that provision from my motion to move this forward with a positive recommendation based on what Carolyn said. And I believe that, that the, the, uh, we'll not get a, a recommendation from the planning department on this until there's a signed development agreement. Right, that's okay. the way it's written. So that in effect uh, answers uh, to, to, for, for my, to my satisfaction, um, Without, without including the provision that we have the development agreement, uh, you know, before the council uh, votes on this. So I will simply, uh, if uh, the seconder agrees, I'll revise my motion to move this ahead with a positive recommendation. I agree. Okay. Uh, oh, we have attorney Seawald. In my experience, when de development agreements are used, the development agreement has to be in place when the city council votes. And so what generally will happen is I would be holding the restriction of the development agreement and in escrow pending the satisfaction of the condition in the development agreement that the city council rezone the land. If the city council fails to rezone the land, I return the development agreement and the restriction is never recorded. If the city council passes uh, the zoning amendment, I then go and record at the registry of deeds and the, and the thing is done. But practically, there's really no way to do this without a development agreement in place. If the zone change is going to be subject to a development agreement, now this is a, a, a zone change that could be, that could stand on its own. Um, but um, you know, there's a development agreement in, in the works, and if that's going to happen, then it, that it needs to be in place before uh, the zone change takes place. Thank you, Alan. I think for me, that clarifies that regardless of which motion goes forward, we are not, uh, I know I'm certainly not going to be comfortable approving the zoning change without the signed developing, development agreement. Um, uh, so I am comfortable moving this forward with a positive recommendation with that understanding. And, and I would say part of it is just that I hate redundancies. Mm -hmm. It's redundant of a few uh, safeguards in terms of the timeline. So for what it's worth, and that is part of what motivates me. Okay, so we have a revised motion on the floor for a positive recommendation, which you have seconded. Okay, uh, any other discussion on this? Yep. Well, I, I just want to briefly um, summarize my uh, the way I see this. Um, uh, I don't think anyone who's spoken tonight has uh, uh, taken issue with the mission of Bombix, uh, and I support very strongly the mission of Bombix. Uh, what is at issue, uh, to some extent, is the, the the mission of Bombix in this particular building, and I believe that the mission of Bombix is tied to this building. The, uh, the vision of a community center for Florence that, uh, that uh, continues the use of uh, the church, the synagogue, a preschool, and now a performance space and gallery, it's, that is integral to what Bombix uh, proposes to do. And I do think that it is in line with sustainable Northampton and with goals set forward in our zoning to support arts and culture. I don't see this becoming another Drake in Amherst. I don't see this becoming a marijuana dispensary, or it can't become a mar marijuana dispensary, but a, a manufacturer of marijuana. I, I believe uh, that it will be a very uh, inclusive and uh, uh, a, a community space that will attract uh, a diverse crowd and will be a, uh, a, a real positive addition to our, our to Florence and to the greater community. 
And uh, I do think that there are provisions in the licensing process that will be used to protect the neighbors and legitimate concerns that they've raised. Uh, that's why I feel uh, I'm, I'm very strongly supportive of the, the zoning change. Thank you, Stan. I will I uh, will build on that. I agree with that. Um, I'd also note that we have uh, ways to address parking concerns through a city council process um, to to change part any parking restrictions that may be necessary. Um, and of course, the noise uh, through the the building department. Um, <clears throat> and we we actually will have uh, until our first meeting in October to vote on this without starting the process over. It's 90 days from today uh, is, is now our deadline. Um, so there is enough time should there be uh, other concerns that arise, um, should the development agreement take longer to, to develop than, um, than we think. Uh, so I'm, I'm comfortable moving this forward. And of course, we'll continue to, to listen to the concerns of my constituents um, as as we move move forward in the process, Marissa. Um, and so I'll just briefly add to that. I uh, I'm confident in the um, in the building department and the licensing um, aspects to to most efficiently deal with the things that are most concerned uh, and appropriately most of uh, most concerned to the neighbors. Um, I, it's particularly uh, meaningful to me that uh, that this is a church that is very culturally and historically connected um, to the city, and I can't imagine a better use that keeps the existing um, spiritual uses in there, um, as well as adding in this cultural element. Um, the city is, we are watching our existing venues uh, be just sapped of all of their cultural energy and force and are not being utilized to the extent um, for various commercial reasons, I guess. Um, but meanwhile, what we don't have a shortage of is empty churches. Um, we seem to have very many of those um, that, that aren't being put to use. They can't be put to use viably. Um, so I, I am very supportive of, of this as a mission and, and, and very comfortable that we can address the concerns uh, to make it an uh, integrated part of the neighborhood. Um, and I'd also just point out, I, I am sensitive to all the things, the constraints about our timeline and what we can vote on and when and what the neighbors are asking us in terms of time. I think that's going to be built into the process by the what's going on in terms of the nego ongoing negotiations and things like that. Um, it, I think it's really important to note that the, the capital changes to the building that are going to be the best way, the way that the sound concerns are going to be most appropriately addressed and most um, securely addressed can't start until we do this uh, and, until this is passed. So, um, so I am, I am confident in the end. My vote is going to be yes for this. I am happy to hear what people have to say about what time is needed to hash things out and to make it the best fit for the neighbors and for the city and the region. Um, but I am particularly excited about. Uh, Bombay X and what they're doing uh, and what it does for the city. So when it comes time, I'll be looking forward to voting yes. So. All right. I'll other? Again. Okay, Jim. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, it, it, it's a church. It's going to be preserved. Uh, it'll have a preservation restriction on it. Um, it's uh, it's going to promote arts and cultures. Uh, it um, that uh, the is it two faith communities are still connected with with the uh, the yeah. preschool is still active that there's a share uh, with the parking you know with the abutting property I that in in so many ways this is this is a this is a win and that you know as somebody who's working on trying to with with uh, residents on trying to save a church in another part of the city that you know to have this in fact this was kind of the ideal situation that you know many of the the folks that are hoping to preserve that structure um we're, we're looking for an arts organization uh connection with the with the community and um and i i you know and and I do think that these that the concerns I, I get 
noise at midnight is not a good thing. And I think there's ways to address that. And that, um, and, and if, and maybe council has a, uh, a role in working with uh, uh, the city to, you know, strengthen the, the regulations around it so we can make it nice and clear. So, um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm going to be supporting this, so. Okay, I think it sounds like we are ready for a roll call on a positive recommendation. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. And yes. Okay, how are we feeling? We have one, and we have two more items uh, on the agenda. Does anyone need a recess? Do, uh, um, should we? Oh, yeah, thank you, Laura. What's up now? Um, and up next is 22.133, an order for special legislation relative to creditable service of William Dwight, referred by city council. <laughs> That's the one you'll have to recuse yourself. I'm going to step so, out of the room. Um, for... I, I would actually propose that we do the last one, reconsideration of regular meeting time first, so that you can just go home. Okay. If you wish. You guys can adjourn without me, you know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move. Um, oh, and thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we'll move out of order to 7A, reconsideration of regular meeting time. Um, Marissa, let me know that she just no longer has the 530 restriction. Um, so we could consider uh, just simply moving to 5 p.m. on the second Monday. Um, but this is a, a time to, if there are other desires to change our time, this is the time to talk about it. Jim. Five sounds great. We're still talking. We're still talking. That we were during, we're taking a break, but we're not. We're doing this. Oh no! I suggested. I asked if anyone needed to take a break, but I did not yeah, hear I you. I took a break. <laughs> oh, do you? Mean... I mentally took a break, but okay. Yeah. If you, if you need a recess at any time, just let me know. Nope. Let's let's plow on. Okay. <laughs> um, so, any other discussion uh, about meeting times before we we'll do a motion on changing it? You're, uh, Mercy, you're permanently good at earlier. I, yes, I can make myself permanently good. <laughs> what are we saying? Five. Yeah. It's fine. Five. Five is fine with me. All right. I mean, I wouldn't cry about four thirty either. All right. We get into the. I know we get into when people can come. And... Yeah, we do have meetings that regularly meet as early as four. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, I guess the question is, yeah, are we are we limiting who can make it by starting so early? Uh, five does seem like a good compromise, given that we we hold public hearings here, and um, in the like city services, the city services meet at four. Yeah, so um, that's one that doesn't hold public hearings. Uh, to me, that that it gives a a you know five is a more accessible time for that I'm fine i was just letting it be yeah yes personally i'd be fine with earlier but i mm -hmm. i, I want to respect that yeah. that balance well, should, can i make a motion that we move uh our permanent meeting time to five okay i'll make a motion because i was the reason second <laughs> any discussion okay roll call please Yes. 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 All right. So, Councillor Nash, did you want to speak to your recusal? Yeah, I'm going to uh, recuse myself from the the last item on the agenda, as I am related by marriage to the person uh, who's being who, who is the subject of that legislation. All right. See you later. Yes. Enjoy your evening. Wow. All right. <laughs> Bye, Jim. You can come back for adjournment if you like. <laughs> you hang out the window right there. <laughs> Move to adjourn for the program. Okay. Um, so, as I said, 22.133, special legislation relative to creditable service of William Dwight. This was referred by city council and... Um, uh, 
why don't we go ahead with a posit with a, a recommendation a motion on that, and then we can discuss it. I would uh, move a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. Would you like to speak to this? Um, I. Uh, is there anybody? So uh, I put this, uh, as I said in the meeting at first reading, I put this uh, forward after um, <coughs> former Councilor Dwight um, explained to me the amount of sort of research um, that he did. And to this particular issue, there are some nuances of the case law uh, of the legal landscape surrounding um, the, the benefits and the way they could be applied. There was also a lapse in communication at the sort of a pivotal time um, that has kind of put him in this position. So, um, so with the caveat that given all the research that he's done, which includes conversations with Senator Comerford's office, that um, it's, is, it's, not a, it's not a high percentage uh, likelihood that it, it goes through at the state level, but, um, but this is the only mechanism by which um, he can, uh, well, he had effectively bought back the time, but he's not getting the benefit um, for that, um, notwithstanding that he'd already previously bought back the, the time, I think, mm -hmm. uh, is my understanding. So, um, so he asked me to put this forward. Uh, I looked at his, uh, his research and the case law around it. I was comfortable with it. I ran it by, uh, attorney, uh, attorney Seawald has taken a look at it. I don't know if he's still on the call. Um, but um, I haven't gotten any feed. Oh, he is. He is. Okay, uh, so I, I guess I would also open it to if he has any feedback uh, mm -hmm. in the interim since this has been percolating. Um, but I, I think it's a question of service. I'd also point out it is not. It's the 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 situation is something that's it's kind of limited to electeds because of their sort of part-time nature and and ten, you know in uncertain tenure they're not city employees in the same way so it has come up in the context of elected officials but i i, I would want to be clear that um this is a kind of a constituent service issue that that if it came up for another uh ilk of city employee uh that it, you know i i certainly hope that Ward council or city council would would cons would consider it and, and entertain uh, this level of research and thought that went into proposing uh, this constituent solution. So, great, right, thank you, um, Attorney Seawald. Would you like to speak to this? So, um, I think this actually all started when I ran into uh, former Councilor Dwight at uh, at Foster Farrar. And uh, we started talking about it. Uh, I, I just want to be clear, though. Uh, you know, I did have a conversation with him. I don't represent former Council Dwight. I couldn't in this situation um, because of you know the city's interest. So um, when Councilor Elkins asked me to help with this, I took the information that was provided um, by uh, Bill and that I assume he got through uh, Senator Comerford's office, but, uh, and I put it into the form of a, of a city council order uh, and uh, that you have before you. Um, that's really been my involvement. I haven't really uh, investigated any of the issues that have been raised, nor have I verified any of the information that Bill provided to me. And do you is anybody have any questions? Um, is this something we've seen happen for other folks? Is this is there is this path? Uh, do you know of other examples? I don't, and not in not in our city. I mean, there is existing case law and around uh, this particular issue, uh, and uh, what opinions from the. Um, Forget the regulation. The I, I forget where the opinion would come from. Would it be the AG's office, uh, Attorney Seawald? I. Uh, uh, I think it may be the Division of Administrative Law Appeals. Yeah, maybe. Um, so it has come up. It has come up in the context of again city uh, electeds, not mm -hmm. um, because you know you, teachers are unionized, the city employees they, they have there's just a different continuity in their service that doesn't. 
um, thankfully does not really provide for, you know, doesn't create this potential gap, because um, some of it also is because Council Bill had a, you know, he served, he stepped away for a bit and then came back. It was in the coming back that there was uh, kind of a, a lapse in communication. So um, I would also just point out this is this is putting, you know, something forward, things like this have gone forward in the, the state. It is then an, and then it becomes an advocacy, you know, it's con con constituent issue, frankly, for Senator Comfort for yeah, for those you know, for those officials, those electeds, um, and those rep elected representatives for uh, Council Dwight. So, um, but otherwise, there's no other mechanism. It is he's just sort of bureaucratically foreclosed. And I'd also keep in mind he's this isn't about like more retirement money or anything like that. He's he's seeking access to health benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's also. We live in a world where you don't have health benefits uh, in the same way, unless you can access it through your employer, or your former employers, um, to the same degree. So right. that is why I agree to put this forward. And what? Stan. Um, yeah, I think I think this is um, this is probably a, a you know a fairly unusual circumstance and. In the interest of it not of minimizing the chance of it happening again, I just wanted to check in, Marissa, with what I think I heard you say at the council meeting, and uh, I I went through what I thought was a pretty thorough orientation in December that presented the uh, options for benefits clearly to me, and I think you said that that you believe that that process has been cleaned up so that. That this that the likelihood of this happening again is is pretty minimal. Is that true? I mean, that certainly was my experience. I went through yeah. the same HR orientation that you did. I assume maybe Councilor Jarrett did mm -hmm. when he was first elected. Um, I will also just uh, reiterate that Council Labarge mentioned um, that you know back pre like that that her experience of of uh, some communication difficulties uh, that she experienced that. And you know, and her longer tenure going further back. So, um, well, I don't. It, it just appears that we have a, a much better uh, onboarding um, experience, maybe than what what they did at that time. Um, and so, I'm I'm confident that it won't. It shouldn't come up again. Uh, but okay. that's based solely on my my own personal onboarding experience, <laughs> not any HR expertise or anything like that. Yeah. So I've, I had a conversation with um, Alan Seewald earlier today and um, just the question of, you know, kind of verifying that this information is true in that and when we're voting, voting on it. Um, so I don't, you said you did, did you, you did some research about this or? Case law that, that he provided. I also know that Councilor uh, Labarge had some questions about what the rate of pay was at the time. Mm -hmm. If you look back on it, I can certainly circle back to her um, uh, to question that. If there's specific questions, um, I guess, about sort of the, the factual uh, uh, background of all this, I certainly would like to know them and then I can, can uh I mean, I certainly can get back to you with answers by Thursday. Um, if there's anything you feel like is left hanging. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't doubt. Um, I mean, I will say, Bill Dwight's, you know, you know, you know I'm sure. The timeline, I did not go into the city records to, you know, pinpoint all the exact days, but I will if you want me to. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, just it's essentially in case a mistake had been made. Um, I don't doubt anyone's intentions. Uh, but just if we're putting this forward to the state, I'd like to make sure that we, we have everything correct. I think we had verified those dates of service too when um, we were trying to find out all the counselors who had served with Councilor Dwight to get them to sign the um, drawer. Uh -huh. um, I remember we actually did go into the city clerk's records to you know, verify the, the dates of service. Okay. The yeah. Five, yeah. As part of that process. So. Right. But I'll super triple check it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Are there any other specific questions uh, that? Um, let's see. 
Let me just bring that up. Um, Yeah, I think it's the specific, we have this specific period, 2012 to 2014, when, you know, he hadn't opted in um, because of a lack of information. So just, you know, we'd want to make sure that, that those, those dates were, were correct as well. Okay, any other uh, discussion on this? Positive recommendation. Okay, we're all call, please. Uh, I'm sorry, Elkins. Yes. Councilman Yes. And yes. Uh, that concludes our meetings. Longer than I thought, um, <laughs> but uh, good to hear from so many folks. And so, um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Roll call. Council Jarrett. Yes. Council Elkins. Yes. Yes. Oh man, we're in person. Can't we do like um, yeah, voice can... votes? I'm just so not used to that. I forget which ones you can do a voice vote on. If there's anyone remotely, is it if any councilor is remotely participating that the roll call votes or just if anyone is? Do you know, Alan? The uh... I, I don't know what the rules are around that. I'm gonna yeah. have to find out. But um, within the next four days, we may have a whole new set of rules. So stand right. by because these set of rules run out on the 15th. Yeah. And, and the legislature is doing its usual thing. Yeah. Well, I will try to familiarize myself with the, yeah, the what, that what you can do a voice vote for and what the <laughs> rules are. So for our next meeting. But we are adjourned. <laughs>